On this episode of, How It's Automated, Turbo Motors. The turbo motor is a more complex and more powerful version of the regular motor. It is a late game component used for building the Mark III minor and particle accelerator buildings along with thermal propulsion rockets. Turbo motors are a forced induction device that is powered by the flow of exhaust gases. Automating turbo motors is truly a test of the pioneer's ability to plan and construct late game factories. So, let's see how it's automated. To start off, pioneers will need four items before automating turbo motors. For the production of regular motors, an iron node is tapped on the shoulder and asked nicely for its juicy ore. The ore travels via perfectly measured sine wave belts to a set of refineries for purification. Inside of each refinery, everything that is not iron is washed away very delicately. Once separated, iron ingots are stacked for easy belting. You can tell they are iron ingots because of the way it is. Some of the iron ingots are routed to a one-stop shop screw production line. For when the need for screws arise, these constructor buildings are a sight to see. Here, the constructors quickly stamp out screws using a preset hydraulic press. The screws and remaining iron ingots are then passed under a series of heating coils for a process called hardening. They are then put through a pool of water to cool them instantly. The quick cooling process establishes a harder, more stable crystalline structure of the metals. Before we follow the screws, let's see where the other ingots go first. Here, another set of constructors use an internal lathe to cut out long cylinders of iron with a quick press and sparks from the robotic arms. The constructor building is truly a work of magic in action. The now iron rods leave the machines in neat little bundles of joy and exit via a wiggly belt. From there the rods now meet back up with the screws to continue their journey. For the next item, both the screws and iron rods are combined inside assembler buildings. Here two belts inject the items to prepare them for quantum entanglement. It can be a lengthy process, about 4 a minute each assembler and don't fret, this factory cart is a highly trained professional. Once fully fused the rotors are freezing and need some time to warm up. The process is endothermic after all, before we see where the rotors go next. A few other items are needed starting with steel. To begin making steel, coal is mixed with some of the leftover iron ore in the first step. Yum, leftovers. Here the iron ore and coal are mixed into a sort of slurry then concentrated to be melted together. What comes out is perfectly stacked bars of steel. The steel ingots are then wave belted to another set of constructors to extrude them into pipes. The bundles come out in sets of three and are taken away to the next stage for further production. The next stage requires a small amount of copper. These pioneers went with refinery buildings to purify it with a little water. Just like with the iron, these refineries also stack the copper ingots in little bundles ready for the next stage. Here the copper ingots are spun into good old 4 out wire for industrial applications. This process turns 15 ingots a minute into 30 wire spools. Once complete, the spools are then routed under the water for further cooling. For the next section, the steel pipe and cable spools are brought together for an epic reunion. Eight assembler buildings are needed for this process. Inside, the steel pipe are cut to size and wrapped with the cable. What comes out the other side is a perfectly crafted stator. As with some of the previous steps, these stators are cooled in the water below because the best thing to rapidly cool copper is heavily oxygenated and mineralized water. For the last step in motor production, four assembler buildings are used to well, assemble the motors. It takes one stator and one rotor to create a motor. The process is very intensive on the metals and as a result, each item shrinks by at least 1%. The now finished motors exit the machines ready for their destiny. A quick bake in the sun allows for even drying of the paint before a friendly drone transports them for later use. With motors complete, we now move on to rubber production. So let's jump in with both feet. To begin the production of rubber, this oil well is pressurized so that the oil rushes to the surface. The oil is routed to a pair of refineries to be processed into rubber with a byproduct of heavy oil residue. 
Some of the heavy oil residue is used to make petroleum coke for a later stage, and the leftover is used as fuel for generating power. It keeps the lights on and whatever lies outside the light, at bay. Nope, I'm out. The rubber packages are classic wave belted to a nearby drone station. From there they will be routed to the final area and that makes two ingredients down for turbo motor production. Halfway, can I take a break now? No, no breaks, last time it was over an hour, just stick to the script, we'll get this done. Fine, but I'm at least taking my pants off, it is really hot in here and the sign on the wall says pants are optional. Rubber down, now on to the cooling systems. To begin the production, bauxite is needed. A miner is placed on a rich node and drilling commences. The drill generates a lot of heat and begins to glow after some time. The ore is belted to a two-step refinery system that first washes it with water creating a slurry known as aluminum neumium solution, then in the second step, purifies it with petroleum coke, which was a byproduct of the heavy oil residue from before. This stage also filters out the remaining water and to help the swamp, the water is piped below to be expelled back into the wild. The aluminum nimium scrap is then lifted to the next floor. Here smelter buildings use the power of an electric arc to melt the metal down. The bucket is incinerated in the process and floats harmlessly away in a gaseous state. The aluminum nimium nimium ingots exit the machines and begin their journey to the next stage, but first, copper is needed and is harvested nearby. Once again Fixit would like to remind pioneers to avoid the miner building once built. They are dangerous and have a taste for pioneer souls. The copper ore is routed up the same building and much like with the aluminum melted in another series of smelters. This goes to show that with enough heat, you can process anything. The copper ingots are wave belted, then Noodle lifted up a floor to meet up with their long lost friends, the aluminum numium ingots. Next up, the copper ingots and aluminum num ingots come together for their annual family photo. Here, assembler buildings merge the two metals into one. The amount of copper to aluminum is a closely guarded fix-it secret. Once properly combined, the material is known as alclad aluminum sh**. If you keep bleeping me, they will think I keep swearing so hurry up and get this finished so you can go to bed. Man I'm trying. Before we can see where the alclad aluminum squares of rectangular goodness are used, another item is needed first. Leftover copper ingots are used here to create those not so steamy copper shits. Really? Come on. The 2D copper planes are created in constructor buildings with another quick stamp of the machinery. What comes out is perfectly rolled up copper sheets that are just slightly warm to the touch. The sheets are then asked nicely if they can be belted to the next floor for further processing. The alclad aluminum sheets and copper sheets are brought together and processed in assembler buildings. Six to be exact. Here, the two items are blended, then molded to become a brand new item called a heat sink. These heat sinks are used to transfer heat away from thermally sensitive components. And speaking of transferring away, the heat sinks are routed to the next floor to be combined into one belt. You know, for easier transportation. From there, they are noodle lifted to the final floor of the building. It is important to allow the heat sinks time to cool so another wiggly belt allows for them to properly dissipate all that thermal energy before being packaged up and sent off to the next and final stage. You go drone buddy. The drone completes the loop by dropping the heat sinks off at a mining outpost. A not so pet friendly drone also arrives delivering the leftover rubber from before. Water is piped in from another local well with a purity of 99.999% pure water. The water is so pure, a special Mark II pipe is used to prevent the water from leaching out the metal. The last item needed is just some good old nitrogen gas. It is extracted from the ground via a well pressurizer. This nitrogen node has been redacted by Fixit for being too good so you won't find this node on the map. The heat sinks, rubber, water, and nitrogen are all used by three blenders to create cooling systems. You can see from above how the blender literally blends the liquids and solids together in a slurry. The liquid is then poured into molds to create what is known as a cooling system. The cooling systems are allotted the proper time to cool before being packaged up for a drone to take them to the final processing area. But one more item is needed before we can show the final area. Radio control units. Only one more item is needed. Let's go. To start off for the radio control unit line, these pioneers begin by processing copper right from the ground. 
This miner hasn't stolen any pioneer souls just yet. The ore is smelted down as smelters that smelt things. Who would have guessed? The copper ingots are then routed to two different sets of constructors for further processing. With the first step, the copper ingots are converted into more of those not so steamy copper shit. Please stop bleeping me. The other copper ingots go through a rigorous two-stage constructor process. First, the ingots are converted to more copper spools. I still wonder where the wooden spool comes from. Next up, the wire is insulated to become RHW2 heavy-duty flexible power wire. Or as the pioneers call it, cable. Before we get to the next production line, a quick word from one of our fans. What do you think of the factory so far? Well said random citizen, I couldn't agree more. Before the copper can be progressed, a little tiny small bit of iron is needed for a few items. The iron is belted in from a nearby node. The waves here keep the sand from getting mixed in with the precious ore. Once the ore arrives, more smelters are used to convert it to the ingot type. Look at all that smoke billow away all those impurities. The second stage of the iron plant involves making those, oh so lovely, screw bolt things. Each box holds approximately 69 screws. Nice. Some of the screws are then whisked away to a later part of this factory, but not whisked like some other factory designs we've seen. The leftover iron ingots are then used by, you guessed it, more constructors and they create the last bit of iron plates needed. Notice how the plates shimmer in the light. Some of the screws in the now oxidized iron plates are brought together and belted into two assembler buildings. Here they are transformed into our favorite type of plate, the reinforced kind. The next item had to be brought in from a very long distance away, so let's see how these pioneers managed to handle the logistics in getting them here. In a distant biome far far away, a quartz node is woken up long enough to produce the desired quartz. The quartz is belted down a longer than normal lift to reach a platform below. Here the quartz is stored in a shipping container until a train arrives to take it on a journey. Look at him go! The train arrives back at the station ready to drop off the quartz. It only needs one step before it is ready to be combined with some of the other items we covered. Here constructors purify the quartz down to remove all impurities by crushing it until the impurities give up. What's left is a somewhat purer form of quartz crystal. 99.55% pure to be exact. The cable, reinforced iron plates, and quartz crystal all meet up at five manufacturer buildings. The most magical of all processing happens in these buildings. Each item is vaporized, then reassembled at the atomic level creating what is known as crystal oscillators. Anything that isn't a crystal oscillator is ejected in a gaseous state into the atmosphere. These oscillators are critical for any electronics relying on timing. And here we go again, before we can show where the crystal oscillators go, another item is needed to be made first. Getting lost yet? Because this sign sure is. Let's dive right in as the finished product is right around the corner. For the next step of the process, plastic is needed, so good old crude oil is located. The local coastal area has it just seeping from the ground. Since the oil is already making its way to the surface, two oil extractors are placed above the holes and the oil is directed into a pipe system. The crude oil flows through the pipe into a refinery station to begin the process. Here, the oil is processed in what is called cracking which turns oil into two products. Plastic and heavy oil residue. Here the plastic is the product we need, and the heavy oil residue is the byproduct. The heavy oil residue is then reprocessed in a few more refinery buildings converting it to a much more flammable substance. You know it's flammable because it's orange and smells of fresh cut oranges. The fuel is then burned in a few fuel generators to provide power for the entire plant. How convenient is that? Now that the byproducts are taken care of, we see the plastic is routed to another train station to make its way back to the rest of the factory. Once the plastic is dropped off, it makes its way over to six assembler buildings and is united with our long lost friend, Copper Shots. I am so glad this is almost over. The plastic and copper planes are combined to create very capable and versatile circuit boards. Who knew they were just plastic and copper? The circuit boards then make their way over next door to meet up with the leftover cable, screws and plastic. Two manufacturer buildings is all it takes to make enough computers for this small factory. Here the computers are swiftly belted away to prevent the humidity from spoiling them. 
these computers are perfectly right. Remember those aluminum and aluminum ingots these pioneers were making before? Here we see the extras dropped off via drone. The aluminum um aluminum ingots are stamped out into what they like to call aluminum casings. Once the casings are cool, they meet up at the final station with the computers and crystal oscillators. Here the last set of manufacturers for this stage are used to automate radio control units. As the radio control units are exiting the machines, they are tuned to a local rock station to ensure functionality. The drone aptly named, Home Free, takes the radio control units to the overall final stage for this factory. Finally, all four items down. Now on to see the final, final stage. Turbo motor time. The radio control units, rubber, cooling system, and motors are all delivered standard fixed airmail. Drone buddies make the world go round. Here, the four items are belted into the final manufacturing station. Once again, the manufacturer buildings work their magic turning these everyday household items into turbo motors. As the turbo motors leave the machines, they get a coating of a clear protectant and spot-free wax. These items must have time to dry and the standard wiggly belt ensures a streak-free shine. The turbo motors finish their tanning session with one last wave belt. To ensure no dust settled on them. The turbo motors are then taken away by yet another drone. But this one will deliver it to any awesome shop around the globe. There, pioneers can spend their hard-earned coupons to purchase them, rather than build them. And that is how turbo motors are automated. These pioneers can now build as many Mark III miners as they need, and with that, provide more resources for Fixit. Turbo motors are certainly no easy task to automate and should only be attempted by veteran pioneers. But doing so, may boost their careers. This was the most requested item for the series to date and with this one down, let me know in the comments below what you would like to see next. Thank you all so much for the contributions. Everything you see here was built during my live streams on Twitch and we had such fun putting it together. Until next time, stay efficient pioneers!